Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. Welcome to Money on Tap. My name is Seth Crossman. I'm here with Dan Mickelin and Ben Brayshaw. How are you guys doing today? Doing really good, Seth. How about you? I'm well. I'm well. Folks, if you are new to Money on Tap, you can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We have a heck of a show here for you guys today. We are talking, it's a part two, building the foundation for your retirement is the idea here. And we're going to be talking about pouring out of your financial foundation. So part one, we built this foundation. Now it's time to get into the different phases of that retirement with you. I mean, you've done so much work building into this idea of retirement. And here it is, right? And if you've built it well, it's going to be incredible. You're prepared. I'm doing well, too, guys. (laughs) I'm doing Wait, good. Who was that? <laughs> who was that guy? <laughs> I, appre- I appreciate that. I'm doing well, Dan. <laughs> Seth, I'm doing good. Thanks. Thank you very, very little. Um, Seth, I'm excited for the show. You know, we've, we talked a lot about building your foundation, creating that nest egg, that value inside your financial health piece. And now you're getting to this super excited thought of how do I distribute my wealth in retirement? And how do I do it really, really well? And I'm excited for this show because pouring out of your your financial foundation that you've built, that you've taken all this time, it is an art. I mean, people think, oh, I'm just going to hit a button and it's going to be good. Well, you got to set up those buttons. I mean, it's it, we use that phrase a lot, but very few people don't differentiate their investment strategies from the accumulation phase of their life and realize that the distribution phase can have a lot more powerful impact on their ability to retire well when done with real intent. And I think that's the piece of this part two that I am excited to explore uh, with you guys and our listeners today. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that, you know, as a practice, you know, truly sets us apart. You know, we talk to advisors from all across the business, you know, other people that do what we do. And, you know, often it's it's a comparative conversation around returns and portfolios and, you know, what, what was your stock pick of the year? You know, but not often enough does the conversation move into, you know, effective distribution and tax consequence and, and understanding the total picture. And really, you know, again, I think of that as, as truly the strength of what we do. Yeah. And I think, you know, for a lot of our listeners, you probably don't know that, you know, Dan and I are actually compliance officers and we supervise other financial planners. We approve their trades and we review uh, what they're doing with their clients and we help, you know, better that that conversation and, and implore some of the thinking and strategies that we have to help them have a better outcome for their clients. So, I mean, it's part of our life is to evaluate these processes in a professional designation scenario as well as do it for the clients that we work with. So I think that's, I think from that perspective, a lot of our listeners probably don't realize that, you know, training and teaching other advisors how to do this is, is definitely on the forefront of our everyday life because we do it (laughs) and really bringing that to, to the public in a way that's just unique. And I think that it it really does set us apart. All right. Hey, you guys, I want to catch up on a couple of things here before we slide into money in the news. First of all, if you are Joining us via radio, thank you. We're glad you're here. We also want to let you know that we distribute this via podcast. You can go to Apple Podcasts, Spreaker Radio, iHeart, iTunes, wherever you find your favorite place to go listen to the podcasts. We're Money on Tap, and this has been a lot of fun because um, for the people that are subscribing to the podcast out there, if you've subscribed to the podcast and send us a personal message at info at your money on tap.com, or you can do it at LinkedIn, any of the places that we're out there, you find us, send us a personal message, letting us know that you subscribe to money on tap. We've got something for you. We want to send it on over to you and just thank you and appreciate you for joining us uh, in that venue. We've got more coming. It's coming. <laughs> but right now it is time for money in the news.
And the first article coming to us, this is from Megan Lionheart from Yahoo Finance. Gen Z and millennials are so broke, they're ruining their parents' retirements. And this is a topic that, that we run into you know, fairly often, not, not certainly with, with every client that we meet as they approach retirement or in retirement, but it comes up often enough that it is, it is a topic that we get to offer advice around and to, to give some counsel around because the statistics here bear out that 7 in 10 parents, so nearly, so 68% with children 18 or older – have made at least one financial sacrifice to help out their kids. And this comes at a cost, you know, to the giver here. And this is the type of thing that, you know, everybody with children out there can can relate to and, and wanting to help out to the very best of your ability. But there there comes that fine line between, you know, when you're really putting your own future in jeopardy. If you were to ask me about that statistic, I would say if you have a kid over 18, 10 out of 10 people have made a financial sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and all, and probably a good nine out of ten are regretting it most of the time between fifteen and twenty. You're just hoping that comes to an end someday. Yeah, I know. I got three in the fifteen to twenty something year old range, and I love them all. But uh, yeah, I'm thinking financial sacrifices daily. But I know what you're saying, and I think we have this conversation with clients all the time. Um, there is this, there is, there is this almost obligatory conversation in the background of our society. I was thinking of one client, the, a woman who was divorced, that you know, her daughter expected her to pay for her college education. And she was marrying some wealthy, flamboyantly wealthy family nationally, <laughs> internationally. You know? and, and she saw it as her mom's duty. And her mom was literally doing it to her financial detriment. She said, I, I need to do this. I told her I would do this. I need to keep to my word. And so forth. And I I really think that that's not an expectation that is something that you have to own. And we talk to clients about that. It's like they have the entire earning power of the rest of their life. Like your earning power time period is shortening every day. And your ability to replenish those funds is getting more and more difficult in the compounded returns that you've worked so hard to make. It's really problematic. And I think this is putting a huge weight because you have these kind of bookend pressures. You have your kids pulling your money from your retirement plans. I've seen people, I mean, I was thinking about the the, uh, the other couple that we had a conversation with too, and they were talking about liquidating his 401k to pay for, for college. And the daughter wasn't even sure she really liked the school. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, well, why don't you go to some other school until she figures out that she likes an $80,000 a year school. I mean, these are conversations that we need to have with people. And that was a difficult conversation to have with them. And we went through it. And But that's what planners do. We don't say all the things you want to hear. But the other bookend pressure is you're losing out. Like the Social Security's future is diminishing in front of our eyes. And pensions are in fear of, of not having enough money there. It's a, I mean, you got all these pressures. It's, it's, it's complicated. Conversations I've had, you know, aren't even on, on things so monumental and these massive expenses, but, you know, we'll sit there and we'll be reviewing some simple household budgeting items and there's, you know, there's an extra car payment or there's an extra cell phone on there. And like, well, who's this? And, you know, these are adult children who are doing fine financially. But <laughs> I have one whose son is an attorney in New York City making an absolute ton of money and his cell phone's on his mom's bill. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, that is crazy. There's all these little things out there that can just certainly be tidied up. And, you know, it's nice and we can appreciate the sediment and where it comes from. I mean, it's straight from the heart. It really is. it is. But somewhere along the way, there's going to be a little reality setting in there. If you're looking for a resource to kind of understand some of the numbers around healthy finances and the economics, the input and the output of, of numbers of who's doing what out there and how it's worked, basically. That's too many words to get to the point of The Millionaire Next Door uh, by Carter Smith and Thomas St. Stanley, PhD, is, is really a great resource for people trying to just understand, am I doing what's in the best interest and the best outcome of the people I love? Because the numbers tell us that, no, it's not. This is not a healthy interaction with our children to um, continue to perpetuate, you know, their ties to us, or, you know, we feel like we're doing something in their best interest, but the, the numbers play don't play out that way. You know, there is also another side of this too, which is just 
the kind of generational finances. There's there are families that have generational finances and they kind of have more of like a board like room that they make decisions around the family's wealth. That's not what we're talking about in this circumstance. We really are talking about, you know, the knee jerk heartfelt response to just take care of something that may maybe would be better to consider a different option. The only thing I want to bring up before we jump to the next article is I thought that the last one of the last paragraphs in this article about the Gen Z was that they found that it was more problematic among lower income households earning less than $50,000 a year to take a financial hit for their children among Americans versus those who make more than that. I thought that was an incredible statistic that more people making less than $50,000 a year were doing more for their children financially taking that retirement hit than people who made more than that. That that's to me is, uh, I mean, I'm kicking you out of the house. <laughs> well, if you didn't know it, here it is. Inflation eased in March by 5% or two, 5%, but core prices remain stubbornly high. Uh, thank you very much. Megan Henney from Fox business. This is uh, this is interesting. This is the, the labor department Wednesday said the consumer price index, a broad measure of the price Everyday goods, including gasoline, groceries, and rents, rose 0.01% in March uh, from the previous month, down from 004 In February, prices climbed to 5% on an annual basis, down sharply from February's 6% increase uh, and the smallest rise in nearly two years. So that's there's there's a couple of different components here to this. There's the uh, the core, and which is the CPI less food and energy, and then there's the CPI. Uh, CPI overall has has declined drastically because it has included that food and energy in there. But those uh, those core prices, a uh, slight uptick. But as you look at this chart, it's, it is really nice to see uh, how far down it is from previous months. And the the question here becomes, what's, what's a play with the Fed? What do they think of this? And how does this, how does this monetary pro- policy progress? I, I thought it was kind of interesting. There's a couple of taglines in here, which I, I think it, the news is hilarious. I love the fact that it's the smallest rise in nearly two years. <laughs> like they, they're playing this fact up because they want they, they there's this whole agenda of, hey, everything's great and 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 wonderful, um, and and they're they're in there. The the facts are in there, but it's like still inflation. I'm quoting: still inflation remains about three times higher than pre pandemic. Average. I mean, there's some some nasty, nasty facts in here that are really, really hard. And I think when you really break it down, the simplicity of this is they're seeing some positive movements, but they're seeing some concerning movements as well. Like, I mean, when you actually break it down, I think what do they say that? Uh, oh, gosh, this is scary to say the cost of groceries fell 03 percent in March, although the 12 month increment remains at eight point five. Four percent. I mean, if you're talking about a two percent in, inflationary rate, um, eight point four is just so far off the mark. I mean, it's just so far off the mark. And it's the problem is, is that the demand is there, and it's there at a massive. I mean, you can't make up for inflationary issues just by raising rates. And I mean, with, with like the avian flu and all that stuff, we talked about the eggs last week, or what you know. I think about that stuff, and it's. You know, there's even more problems. I was I was talking to somebody else about eggs. I'm like, I'm glad I ordered these stupid chickens because, you know, it's going to be like ten dollars a dozen for eggs here soon. You know, they're talking about there's even more problems with some of the uh, egg manufacturers. So, yeah, I mean, inflation's here. I mean, there's there's no doubt that it's been. You know, the the the, the vocabulary has changed from transitory to stubborn. Right. Well, is it, is it is it is it going to go down? I mean, it's here. It, is it no longer inflation? It's just it's the standard. It's the new price of doing business. You know, I, I, I see this as probably the outcome here. I mean, uh, the increasing in, in cost is, is going to level off and has, has begun to do so. But, you know, a return to lower prices across the board, I'm not sure that's in the cards. Yeah, I think that's a complete misnomer. I think the, the concept that this is something they're going to mitigate and get us back to. I think we've hit this inflationary event and they're going to get us maybe to – Two or three percent of on top of all of this. <laughs> That's where, where I'm scared. I, I think some of the interesting pieces around the data and the data dependent clause that everybody's kind of relying on out there is that the 
the information that we have right now is the pre-SVB bank failures, right? And so it is going to be interesting to see what data is going to become important moving forward. Is it going to be the CPI? Is that still going to be what they're going to be going off of? Or are they going to start to look more at, you know, the profitability of companies and, um, you know, there's earnings reportings coming up. Uh, I think there's a lot of people out there that have a sentiment that that's going to become more of the data that's, that they're going to look at and potentially going to start to look at any reason that any reason to start to tap the brakes a little bit. And it wasn't in this article, but I did, I did see as I was kind of compiling, you know, the, this information for today's show is that Canada just started pausing their actual interest rate hikes and we've, a, you know, significantly intertwined economies there, but they've, they've made that step and they've, they've cut the increases. So that's, you know, potentially good news. Well, I, you know, I mean, I saw on CBC today too, that, uh, Almost seventy percent of the financial institutions believe rates are going up another quarter point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, I do think the Fed. I, I I really do think, and I've said this multiple times. I think that a year, twelve to fourteen months from now, will be a point higher uh, across the board. I think the Fed's got another point coming our way. You know, whether it's a quarter point, this skip a you know skip a period, and then another half a point, and then skip a period, and then you know another point quarter point. I mean, I think we got a point coming, folks. I mean, and that's. The whole like idea. You're trying that, to make a point here, Ben. I am. I'm trying to make a point because I think the whole concept of <laughs> raising rates as being transitory. I think they have to pause at some point because these banks, they can't crash and burn the banks unless that's what their goal is to do. So, you know, at, at some point in time, they have to pause to allow some of these, you know, these investments, the bonds that they bought from the treasury, these banks, for some of those to mature, banks to get their money out and then buy new bonds to bring the value of their debt up. They have to let this happen. So they have to allow that cycle to occur. So there's going to be some pauses, but I think we got a point coming over the next 12 to 14 months. Oh boy. Just had a whole bunch of packed in there. Could the Fed actually want the banks, want to collapse the banks um, with the new federal currency rolling out? And all I that do think stuff? so. <laughs> I do. Oh my gosh. All right, hey folks, we got a couple. We got one one more minute here to uh, talk about Biden proposes the toughest auto emissions rules yet to dramatically boost EV sales. This is uh, from Emma Nuremberger, and uh, yeah, this is the the next proposal. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, proposed a new tailpipe emission limit that could require as much as sixty seven percent of all new vehicles sold in the U.S. by twenty thirty two to be all electric. Gosh, there's just you know what, Ben? I'm just going to go ahead and hand this one back to you because we're we're talking about all sorts of oil and gas things. And <laughs> yeah, I think this is totally crazy. I mean, what happens if you know of all the people that walk into every dealership don't want to buy an electric car? I mean, you're going to force them to buy it. Like, I mean, how do you how do you quantify? I mean, are you going to limit the amount of gas only production vehicles, and so therefore it's sold out of gas, and therefore you can't buy one? I mean. That's socialism at its core. I mean, just the idea of it. I, I appreciate they want to deal with the emissions, but I mean, the first place to start negotiating would be China because we could do all of this. And I've heard the impact of China just reducing coal production across the board would, would astronomically change the entire amount of, compared to the output we have. I mean, so, there's so many issues with this proposal. I mean, um, the, and the simplest one is, you know, th- to get there would require that by the year 2032, 67% of all night light duty vehicles sales and 46% of all new medium duty vehicle sales would have to be EV and as it stands right now only 5.8% of overall car sales are electric vehicles and they're still is, significantly more expensive and we still lack charging stations and we which can't, is only an can't increase of, batteries which is only an increase of 3.1% from last year i mean People are not looking for that. That's not the focus of it. Like, I mean, I'm not against EV. I mean, I we own a, a hybrid vehicle. I'm not. I'm not against it at all. But I also own a truck. You know, like we're moving stuff around. I'm gonna have chickens. I mean, like you know, going back to farm life. I don't want to be worrying about whether my battery's charged. I need to drive down and deal I, with some chickens. I'm right there with you. I have no problem with there being EV and technology expanding and and all the benefits of that. But you take a look at how much it actually costs or, you know, what does it cost the environment to produce that EV? And you're trying to sell me on, you know, the environmental benefits of that EV versus, you know, hey, Keystone Pipeline, first week in office, let's shut that down. Uh, Nordstrom, what do we say about that? Um, Just there's 
there's stuff out there that they've got to make. Like, they they got to make the you price buy. of gas so high to force everyone to do this. I mean, I don't think right. people realize that the only way you're going to literally walk through the dealership and say, oh, "Of course, I do not want that gas-powered vehicle," is because gas is going to be twenty dollars a barrel. I mean, a gallon or ten dollars. I mean, some crazy number that you're like, "I can't afford to own a gas vehicle." But what we don't quantify is the amount of electricity that is made by all sorts of different carbon producing assets across the board. I mean, we don't, our infrastructure and our telephone lines, I mean, telephone electric lines are just, they can't even handle the demand of 67% of these vehicles being able to do it. I mean, California hasn't done hardly the updates to their infrastructure that they need to. I mean, we got some serious problems. We got big dreamers here and reality is just not set in. We are going to have some fun here coming back with you to pour out your financial foundation. That was our money in the news. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. For a number of our listeners, they have a lot of questions, and you might be one of them. Today, we're just offering what we call Zoominars, webinars over Zoom meeting rooms where we have top experts, social security, estate planning, and financial planning experts for you to speak with, do a private consultation that way today. We're also having webinar-based Zoominars where we're going to have multiple groups where you can be part of that and enjoy that as well. Give us a call at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at your money on tap. Dot com to schedule your Zoominar. We appreciate you listening to Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. You can contact us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's program. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are talking about pour out your found financial foundation. You have done a beautiful job of building this nest egg and you have put the, the foundational elements in place to make it something that is going to be able to sustain you for the rest of your life. Now, the question is, now that I've created this, how, how do I start to use it in different ways to accomplish these goals, these, these other goals now that I'm transitioning towards? And what does that look like? What's a, what does a healthy retirement look like? And um, how sustainable is that? There's ways to do this that are, that are again, they're foundational, there, uh, some of these might be greater or lesser, depending on what your story is. And it's a great conversation for us to have with you today. I'm excited to jump in with you guys. Uh, before we do just one thing, I want to make a quick note. If you are joining us via podcast, please subscribe and send us a note just saying, hey, subscribe to your podcast at info at your money on tap dot com or you can DM any one of us on uh, you know, social medias that, that we have out there. You can find us at Money on Tap. And uh, we want to send you a thank you for joining us in the podcast world. All right, guys, let's go. Well, you know, when we talk about pouring out your financial foundation and, and dealing with moving from that accumulation phase to the distribution phase, a lot of people see it as a light switch. You know, it's on, you know, I'm accumulating, I'm accumulating off, I'm not accumulating, I'm now distributing. It's, it can be that way. We have people walk through the door every day and say, I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> I need income. What's the best way? I heard about you. I want to give you, a, give you a shot at taking a look at how to solve this problem. That's one way. And then there's people who realize that, you know, it can be better than a light switch. You can make a more powerful move by, you know, making discerning decisions earlier to position yourself in a better financial position for distribution when retirement happens. <clears throat> and those are people that we can help uh, even more uh, usually. And I don't want to, you know, if you're just entering retirement, I don't want you to run scared and say, hey, I could have done more. You can't look backwards. Um, but the first thing that 
you know, we usually start with is, you know, there's, there's kind of like the three step process of understanding your expenses. You know, when you really, you know, start engaging planning and understanding what retirement looks like or what it's going to be, it's understanding your core needs. That is the literally the bare essentials. That is food, housing, clothing, car payments, things that you will not change in your daily life for a long period of time, whether it's five years or 10 years. And understanding like if your house has five more years to be paid off of, then then there's some time horizon sets that you might create income for or distributions that will meet those needs till that need is completed. But understanding those core needs and how they look like, for instance, we have people who who buy long-term care insurance and they might be uh, 60 years old and they're saying, I'm entering retirement early and they're going to make 10 years worth of, of long-term care payments to be paid up and be done. We'll build that into a financial distribution program that gets those payments paid for and fit it, you know, fit to a perfect mold. And then at the year 10, we can drop the core need down and, and we work on those types of things. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great point to encourage people to, to begin this conversation earlier, you know, to think of these things, you know, maybe as you watch your parents go through it, right? Because there's a couple of these expenses, there's a couple of these risks that would be better addressed, one, when you're younger and healthier, and two, when you're still earning an income, the regular income through your employer, so that by the time you do hit that date in which you envision yourself flipping the switch and moving into retirement in the distribution phase, some of those costs may be either entirely or at least largely paid off before you get there, which will just set you up for a far more comfortable retirement that helps you kind of move down the list from core needs, which we just addressed, into things like your wants, your desires, your dreams, and additionally concerns, things for like a, continuing to have that emergency fund in place that we talked about in the last show and, and how do you address health concerns and that, that might be something that we can – tackle while you're in your mid 50s as opposed to mid 60s. Yeah, there's a there's a a lot of things that people grow accustomed to especially when they're in an accumulation phase. One of those is obvious, it's the income, right? It's we've we've got this business or this job or you know however we've been creating income to start to uh supply this future need over here and then identifying like once we've kind of left that income aside what are the pieces that we're going to really need to start to to fund? Like, what are what are our future needs going to be? Um, you know, we talk about you know the the, the emergency health fund, or um, and then there's the, the wants, desires, and you know what you have as far as your your dreams out there. But the first things first, right? We've really got to make sure that that foundation is covered. And you and you did a great job giving an example of of, of how to transition monies in fr- from this this um, pool of cash or or securities or how, however you have accumulated and putting these other pieces inside and understanding okay I've designated this part from this over here I think interesting around that is um, you just have different personality types we all deal, we all are familiar with them there's your uh, you know your super savers, and then there's your ones that really just don't really pay much attention to that. And then all of a sudden they're like, "Hey, I've got I've got this this windfall over here," and it just all gets spent. Um, it's somewhere in between there is where most people kind of lie. Um, and it's interesting to see how sometimes people will will have trained themselves to have some negative feelings around ever possibly touching the money that they've accumulated. You know, that's another extreme that we come across as well. It's like, I'm, I'm a bad person if I go over here and start to use this money. And to get outside, I think one of the greatest things we can do is really start to help orient our mindset around what do we have, how are we doing this. And if we've done this, and, and ideally, we've come to this place where we've had these conversations and had start to prepare well before we flip the switch. So we under, we've already identified how we're going to start to do these things. But but um yeah, it's an, it's a very interesting challenge that different personalities face as they start to go through the transition. And I just want to, if you're in that, I just want to say, first of all, congratulations. Like, pat yourself on the back because you're here, okay? And then also, um, give yourself a little bit of a break, too. Don't, 
you know, don't beat yourself up, up over like Ben was saying what you could have done or what you would do differently. That's great. That's wisdom to be able to have that and look back and say, okay, this is where this is where I would have made some adjustments. Pass that wealth on, right? That is that is wealth for you to be able to continue to pass on in different ways. But you know what? You're here. This is great. Yeah, I think you know. Probably the first piece that we we chat about is, you know, with people when we talk about these things is like your your past. Yeah, it's, it's your past, and and using that to amplify your future is better. But to 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 woe on that experience and you know to focus on that is just it's not a healthy place to be. And um, even if you're you know, Gen Z child is, you know, robbing you blind of your retirement, you know, like we can't talk about that from the money in the news scenario. But um, I would just ask our listeners, you know, what's holding you back? You know, what's holding you back from really embracing this and, and sitting down with somebody and saying, hey, you know, this is what my needs are. This is what my my concerns are. And this is what my wants are financially. And, and do you see the ability to solve this problem? Because I think I see it but I'd like to do it in the best way I possibly can. Because some people say, yeah, I've got enough money. I, I can solve these problems. I can self-insure. I don't need, I don't need long-term care insurance. I, I, the, I've got enough assets to create enough income for me. And I, you know, I, I've thought about inflation and the cost of living and what it's going to be like 20 years from now or 30 years from now in retirement. I, th- I think I've got enough. Well, that's great. I'm glad you, you think. But what happens if you can affirm that for sure, or you can amplify what you think you can do to a higher level. I think that's the piece. You know, <clears throat> Dan, we were talking earlier before the show. I wish we record before the show. <laughs> Sometimes we were talking, <laughs> but we were talking about some of these big box investment companies out there where, you know, there's millions, billions of dollars pouring in every day. And, and um, you know, there's this huge estate that we have relationships in, in, these, in these companies. And we hear about these massive estate problems, like these huge taxable events that could have been easily mitigated because they don't do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really one of our strengths here is, is not only do we lay the plan, but we, we consider the important checkpoints. And, and one of the important checkpoints to consider in our conversations is the last one. It's the end, right? Mm-hmm. How do you envision this, if there's anything left, transitioning to those coming behind you? And how can we do that efficiently? How can we maximize your life's worth of hard work and not just fork it all over to the government? You know, that there's a skill there. There's a talent there. And, and just as much so, there's a willingness and a determination to have that conversation. You just need to sometimes go there with people. You can't fear the reaction because you, you – you don't understand necessarily, especially when you're newly meeting with people, how much thought they've put into that, whether that's a concern of theirs or at all. And that ranges. There are some people, lots of people will see, will say, well, if there is anything left, great. But, you know, providing for that is not a core need that I have. But when you look at the approach that other advisors take, it's just this constant accumulation model. It's accumulation, accumulation, accumulation. You know, it's very important if you want to be efficient and not waste money in retirement and, and into the last phase to consider the distribution end. And I'll, I'll tell you that for, you know, for, for some of our listeners, what I'm going to say now makes a lot of sense for them. It's like, I'm not concerned about how much money I make anymore. I just don't want to lose it. I need my income and I don't want to lose the wealth I've taken work so hard to do. And if, if that's where you're at in life and that, and that resonates with you, that's the conversation you have to have like that, that, you know, when an advisor's telling you, you know, hey, this is how much we made. This is what we did. Yeah, we have to perform. We have to make money. We have to invest and so forth. But creating that conversation about how to preserve your wealth and create income, that's what distribution is about. So when that starts resonating with you and if it's not resonating with you now and and so forth, you're probably not either you're probably not either ready for retirement or if you're in retirement, no one's educated you on a couple of different factors that you're still buying a sales tech technique and you're not really doing the planning anymore. And it's kind of scary when people talk about that because it, it's just missing the boat. It's just missing the entire thing. Now there's some people who just don't have enough assets and they've got to make more money and they got to figure it out. And I, I get that that's what you need to hear. But the truth is, is if you're taking so much risk that you lose way more 
in the market than you could ever potentially make in a, in a retire and you're walking into retirement, you're not walking into retirement. You're walking into your job next week because you still have to be employed because you still got to pay the bills. And that's the risk some people are taking and they don't even realize it. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Talking about pouring out your financial foundation, entering into the distribution phase of retirement. Hey, congratulations. You have arrived. You are officially here in retirement. Most of the time we find people, you know, love this idea of like an early retirement. You know, I mean, that sounds that sounds wonderful. What does that mean, right? We're going to go and spend time doing these other things other than work that we'd like to, you know, spend our time doing. So what is holding us back? If we're, you know, there, if we've accumulated enough money to, to make it possible, what holds people back? And most of the time we find it's income. It is this income piece. So a lot of the time people just cannot seem to pull the trigger until they have the social security piece in place. So why is that? I mean, for, for, for people that are retiring, maybe that's a significant part of the income. Maybe it isn't. Regardless, the numbers tell us that most of the people aren't going to retire until they start to collect that social security. And what we find is critical for people is having that transition from job, business, income, consistency, having that in place having a consistent income to be able to cover those core needs at a minimum and then you know crafting their life around that minimizing expenses or finding that they've you know got enough of their core needs met and now they have this freedom to be able to explore other options and do these other things that they've planned around or want to do in retirement the idea here is consistent across the board for whichever generation you're coming through is to go ahead and nail that down that you know kind of bulletproof your retirement right so that foundation is in place and that is just it's a huge we just find i find it is so huge for people to experience freedom in retirement and they get that once they have that piece nailed down yeah i would say that the idea of creating consistent, reliable, and guaranteed income sources and, and figuring out what those are for you to meet up with those core needs is, is a big part of the conversation that we have. And, and honestly, evaluating the risks that you want to apply. Because you know, for some people, when we use the house analogy in the part one of the show and the idea of, of building a home and the cement foundation that you build. But you know, my, one of my brothers builds homes and he builds all cement homes. <laughs> You know, and like, that's a, that's not just a foundation. (laughs) That's a fear concern. Like I want a house that's impermeable, you know, and if that's what you want, well, then maybe that's, you know, what you're going to put in place for your, not only your core needs, but your real concerns and maybe some of your wants, like you might really get aggressive on that. You might say, I want to put all my money in the bank at a CD paying me X, Y, Z percentage because they're higher now. And then they've been in years and that's enough for me to live off of. And I'm happy with that cement foundation. I'm going to find enough banks that meet all the FDIC coverage for me. Hey, if that's what makes you feel good and help you sleep at night, I am all for it. Like it, it's not like we have no need for you to become a client. We can buy CDs for you if that's what really what you want to do. But I would just encourage you that, you know, having some nice relationships in town and your local banks that might be really the, a good fit for you. And that's okay. But there's other people who say, hey, I'm, I'm happy with building two by six walls and insulating them and putting sheetrock and, and siding on there. And I, I want to invest in the, in the market and buy certain things, but I'm going to meet my core needs and, you know, or I'm going to meet a portion of my core needs. And instead of building a full, you know, walk-in basement to extra high ceilings, I'm going to, I'm good with a slab and I'm going to pour, you know, footings to make sure the frost heaves don't take over, you know, and. Whatever that story is, it's it's totally reasonable. And we try to fit both the core needs, your risk tolerance, the time horizon on each of those needs, and and then building those income sources around it, starting with things like Social Security. And if Social Security is something you're in question of, we can start building either without it or only using the you know 70% rule or the 50% rule on that piece. Dan, Dan what, if I, uh, what if I want a moat? And crossbows. 
I can give you the entire survival perspective, Seth. <laughs> I think Ben's digging a moat right now. I am digging a moat. I'm going to dig a moat. <laughs> How did I know? <laughs> you know, I, I think I think people don't, and I, we use these analogies for a lot of people because the complexity of our industry is just the both the complexity and the vastness of our industry, and being able to go to somebody as a sounding board and say. These are all my fears and concerns. This is what I've got, and I'm concerned I don't have enough. I, I wish I had done more. It's okay, you know, but you need somebody who can say, with this, here's, you know, your top 10 options, you know, based off all the knowledge, the hundreds of years worth of industry knowledge that all the partners and planners here have combined. Here's what we can, here's the, here's the framework. How do you feel about this? Let's test this concern. Let's work through that. How many people, I, I got to tell you, I would say three out of four people that I've met with in the last, at, at least the last four people that have come in, I'm just thinking to myself, have no will, no trust, no power of attorney, no health care directive. They're going to die intestate if they don't take care of these things. That's a real problem. It's like, I just think about the amount of things that people don't even realize how easy it is to take care of that. And they're like, boy, it just seems like a real big process. I'm like, putting a will and trust together, if you're working with a planner, Making any changes to it is really a phone call. You know, it's like we have an attorney that literally works here in our office. He, you know, it's it's a it, he's general counsel for us. He can handle it. If you want us to work with your attorney, these are things that can happen. People need to cement all of the pieces that they are concerned about. But there's some pieces if you don't cement them, the financial catastrophe awaiting you and your family could be absolutely devastating. You're listening to Money on Tap. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We are talking about pouring out of your financial foundation and entering into the distribution phase of retirement. You're listening to Money on Tap. We will be right back. Folks, it is so much fun for us to bring you Money on Tap. My name is Seth Crossman. And I am one of the hosts here at Money on Tap. I'm also a financial planner. That's what we do. That's what Ben and I do. And the fun part is, is we get to have this radio show. We talk about important things that we think you need to listen to and be aware of to help raise the bar as far as your financial literacy. It's a big part of what we're trying to do here. The other thing that we're doing here as well as financial planners, we are welcoming you to come and call us and to join us at Brayshaw Financial Group. Experience what complete wealth management looks like. Let's take a look at all sides of the issue, get a three-dimensional perspective, and put a plan around your next step. It's so critical, and so many people just leave this part out, and then they find out later, oh, if I only would have known. Hey, don't let that be your story. Give us a call at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. If you have $250,000 of investable assets today, our plan is free to you. We think it's important for you to know the facts and have a playbook so you can have a successful retirement. Give us a call at 855-226-8551. Thanks for listening. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And we are talking about the pouring out of your financial foundation, entering into the distribution phase of retirement. It's an exciting conversation for us, really it is, because it's where we get into some serious solves for our clients. And it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful experience in planning where you go through the process and, and you know, at the, you, you, over here you have your concerns, you know, the, these dreams, concerns, the, the, the what-if scenarios that we, that we have. And then to be able to come through with a plan that addresses those. And maybe some of those aren't immediately addressed when you start to go in through the planning process. But we start working through those pieces. And as we get to this distribution phase, 
you have some real concerns. Like, how do I make sure that when the market, you know, has a horrible year or two, that I'm still in this retirement corridor? Like, I retirement's a reality for me. And it's not now I have to go try to figure out how to earn back some of that money. In order to do that, um, Ben was just right at this place of, of really trying to evaluate the validity right the the reliability of these distributions and what are some of those pieces and how do we really understand yes i'm okay with what i've where i what i have under the hood here and it's going to work yeah that's a great question like how do you determine like i have a a valid reliable income solution for my own planning and the, i would say probably the easiest one i would do there's there's a lot of tests that we do internally but the easiest one i would say to you is if the stock market goes down 30 percent next year are you concerned about how much income you're going to receive will you question whether you should take the income you planned on taking next year if the stock market drops like that because if we live naively that that can't happen that's when you're really going to have to figure out, like, am I prepared for it? Because you can't just be naive to that, that, that standpoint. You know, reliability on distributions is something that you can take with zero fear of making sure that your core needs are met and that there's no woe or concern. Wow, this is really going to impact my future. Yeah, we, we have tools that we use often that, that really build in that foundational income need in a sense that is, you know, either entirely guaranteed or near to it. And th- that that's having that foundation laid and understood and having that be the, the first step in the, the planning process, you know, allows you to have other assets that can, you know, withstand the ups and downs of the market, but are dedicated to other needs. Okay. So if the market drops 30%, it's not a question of whether the heat stays on and the mortgage gets paid, maybe put off that vacation you wanted to take or the new car has got to wait another year or so. So not to say there wouldn't be any ramification for you if you have money in the market and you suffer a year like that. But those core needs, we can take off the table and we can make sure they're there for you. Yeah, but and at the same time, though, if, if your core needs are going on the vacation, we can solve that, right? Like that's, sure. you know, that's... You define the core for us. Right, exactly. And I think that's the piece of the conversation that we're really kind of engaging people is say, hey, listen, you tell us what you want out of your retirement, what it looks like, what you can do without, and what you need to be there. And that's what we design our plan around is that's why it's articulated to be your plan. It's about your plan. It's your money. It's it's entirely about you. That's why our, our website address is yourmoneyontap.com because it's about you. And people don't realize that. They go to advisors and, and they're like, well, this is what we do and this is how we do it. It's like, well, that's great. Now you get to search an advisor that does something you want to now buy and you have to evaluate that. Or you hire a planner who says, let me figure out the plan that resolves your needs. And that's the difference. You stop shopping. You stop window shopping and you go to a tailor and they build you the suit you want to wear. And that's the difference between planners and advisors. Um, I think I think we, you know, Dan, I, I think sometimes – the way you articulate things just it, it humbles me honestly. I really think sometimes the way you language things is really powerful, and I think when we were talking about you know when it's when it's about what we do and how it's we're tax focused we're income focused we're we're not worried about the return when it's really about income we're not talking about the different conversations. Share more about that yeah, I think that's you know at the end of the day the the people that we're dealing with. You know, they have a vision of retirement that includes a lifestyle. It includes trips. It includes times with their grandkids. It very rarely looks like an account statement, right? So they're not aiming at a number. And we've, we've brought up the commercial a million times. That used to be the ING commercial, I think it was, yeah. where you get the guy walking down the street chasing this fictional number. You know, that's not how we do it. We don't feel most of our clients think of it that way. You know, we want to take your dreams – and help you make them a reality the way you define them. And again, consistently, that's not a number. That's not what you wake up thinking of. It's not what you work 30, 40, 50 years to achieve is some number on a page. It's this vision that you have. 
And we want to make that a reality for yeah, you. Yeah, you don't look at your account statement and all you see when you look at these numbers is something like the Matrix and it's the picture of your Hawaii vacation. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I think about the Matrix where they were looking at all those numbers on the movie and they supposedly saw you know, the world around them. Right. That's just not the way it works. Great points all the way around. I uh, you know, was thinking about risk and trying to understand like different parts and pieces of the plan. And we have a ton of tools on our website. You guys, you can go to brayshawfinancial.com, go to resources, and you're just going to find calculators and all sorts of articles, all sorts of stuff there for you. But one of them that we, we highlight very often is a free risk analysis. This is a right out of the gate. You pour your portfolio into here, and you're going to start to understand what volatility looks and feels like. There's some questions in relationship to you know different market scenarios. What if this happens? What if that happens? That's a good start for you to really start to understand how do I, you know, where am I at right now? And the likelihood of you being where you're at right now, where you're in retirement are very different. Now, those are some fun DIY things for us to go ahead and use. And when it comes down to, you know, us starting to pull these pieces together, right, there's things that we're going to bring to the table with you. Like, for instance, well, you've got a uh, 401k plan. And right now, most of your assets you've built are in that 401k plan. Okay, well, this is the tax. This is how the taxes work for you through retirement. We've got some tools to show those things to you as well. There's opportunity a lot of the time, especially early on in this transition for you, where there's, you know, uh, you might do a conversion into Roth. You might do some of that long term planning and conversion into some different uh, long term planning, long term care, long term plan long-term care planning instruments. There's just opportunity if you're aware. And if if you're not, I don't know how you would be other than you're just, you, you're a longtime listener here with us. And you remember the show where we talked about these things. Awesome. This is the time, right? This is where you get to, you really get to make it happen and you get to just, oh, I get to, I'm, a, I'm pumped. I don't know if you can tell. I'm pumped because when, when you put those things together, it sings it really resonates and it sings in the confidence that people have moving through that process of the, all the pieces coming together. It's beautiful. And it's usually not the way that people think because they just haven't even uncovered some of the complications or some of the hidden desires. That's part of what this process pulls out for you when you start to pour out into your retirement. Yeah, I would say... The last piece that you know really does make us unique too, and I, I not that other people don't do it or do it well or you know whatever their quantification of uh, our version of the home inspection on this on this illustration is that you know we get together with our clients regularly. I mean, you know, we have calls with clients regularly. I was just actually you know submitting notes to one of our compliance officers on, on a client's work that we were doing for them for their records, and he's like. Man, you got notes everywhere. <laughs> He's like, you know, because we're constantly in touch with people on a lot of different issues. If something's moving or changing, we're doing it. We're having those conversations. I think it's one thing our clients say is that, you know, I don't always feel like I have to call you. I, I get that a lot. Like, boy, you always, you know, you're always responsive. I had one client who, you know, it's tax season and, you know, we're racing around and they like, wow, your response is really quick. And it was like 1030 at night because I was still working. And they had responded and I was responding back. I go, well, this one's quicker. Here you go. <laughs> you know, so having that home inspection and kind of going over the assets, it's like, it's not a one time sit down, do a plan. Planning is a forever relationship, finding that partnership, finding that person, because at some point in time, if you're doing it yourself or you're working with somebody that you don't feel is like partnership, you know, quality, that's not what you have. You're going to have to pass that baton at some point to somebody and really count on them to help fulfill the final stages of that plan to, to carry out that stuff. And do you want it to be the husband or wife who hasn't managed it and knows nothing about it or pass it on to your children who don't have time to do it and then they're picking out a planner? That's that's a complicated scenario. Yeah, and sometimes it's it's worthwhile just having that that partner who just doesn't have the same emotional involvement in what's going on. You know, they can make decisions hotter and can make people, you know, they're just they're dealing with the life issues when we can take a step back and deal with the financial issues, right. which are sometimes not the same. That's a big difference. You've been listening to Money on Tap, and you can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. 
It has been a pleasure spending time with you this week. Hopefully you get a chance to go to the podcast and subscribe. Send us a message. Let us know. We've got something that we want to send you back. And we appreciate you being here with us on Money on Tap. Make it a great week. Be successful in your investing. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit or protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through SagePoint Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group, LLC, are independent of SagePoint Financial. SagePoint Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551.